Okay, hi there and welcome to video four in our series of six, taking you through some of the key micro diagrams for your economics exams. In this video, we're going to look at the theory of the firm. Uh, I'm going to assume that you're part of your way into revision. I'm not going to go through all the basics with you and it might be a good idea to have your revision notes or your class notes to hand so you can check through as we go through. Keep in mind also you can take a screenshot whenever you want and press the pause button uh, to go through the diagram in more detail. So important, I think, initially to think about uh, the cost of a business. And we normally make a distinction between fixed and variable cost. Typically, dough, raw materials, ingredients used by bakeries will be variable costs. If you get a question on Amazon, the packaging used by online retailers is a variable cost to a business. Costs that depend directly on output. Whereas, again, taking a business like Amazon, the long-term lease on a big fulfillment centre, a distribution centre, shown here is a fixed cost where and also likewise the cost of acquiring patents uh, would also be treated as a fixed cost of production however an evaluation point is that there are big advances in digital technologies and many fixed costs traditionally in the textbooks are now really variable costs if you have for example software for employees workplace productivity software cloud computing services such as dropbox and, and others if those uh, services are on a per capita basis, in other words, the, the based on how many people work for the business, then effectively those kind of costs now become variable costs. It's an interesting evaluation point. Uh, another key diagram to think about in terms of cost is the average fixed cost curve shown here on the right. Average fixed cost will always fall because the total fixed cost of production are constant they don't vary with output. Therefore, the higher the output, the lower will be the fixed cost per unit. As you can see, if the fixed cost is £2,000, the average fixed cost is 2000 if output is 1, but obviously it then halves if output is 2, and the average fixed cost will always fall uh, as some topic to the origin. Uh, again, before we go through the main diagrams that form the bulk of this video, also worth bearing in mind that you sometimes have to explain the nature of cost and the shape of the marginal cost curve is drawn on the assumption that there are diminishing returns to extra units of the variable factor, which is normally labour. So here's a numerical example of the law of diminishing returns. Eventually, marginal product starts to fall in red, uh, returns to labour diminishing. And again, eventually, that drives down the average productivity of labour. I used to tell a really funny joke about the law of diminishing returns, uh, but I won't tell it again. It's just not as funny second time around. So let's go through some of the main cost revenue through the firm diagrams that you're going to need for your exams. And again, hopefully you've got your revision notes in front of you so we can work through this together. The key thing, I think, in terms of diagrams is to make sure you draw your short term costs in the prescribed way. And normally we assume marginal cost falls, then rises due to diminishing returns. Marginal cost must, repeat, must cut average variable cost and average total cost at their minimum points. This is one of the, those things that examiners are particularly pedantic about. So get those right. Practice your diagrams, I'm sure you are, to make sure they look really good. Notice here that the gap between cost per unit AC and AVC is falling. And of course, that goes back to the idea that the fixed cost per unit fall as output increases. OK, uh, moving on. Yep, OK, we need to think about shifts in cost curves. Quite a big exam point coming up here. If the variable costs of production, if they change, then there's a shift in both marginal and average cost, as shown here in my diagram, an increase, for example, in, in component costs or perhaps a carbon tax or some other cost of production. Increase in variable costs leads to an upward shift in both marginal and average cost, whereas a change in fixed costs has no effect, no effect on marginal cost. Marginal cost only relates to variable cost. This is a very common question, particularly the Edexcel board. Then moving to long term costs, you don't necessarily need a very, very complicated diagram for this. Long run cost, of course, is where firms can change the scale of production. 
they can change all of their inputs of production. And uh, you basically need to draw the possible shape of the long run average cost curve. When there are increasing returns to scale, average costs are falling. We call that economies of scale, from e.g. from Q1 to Q2. Eventually, we may reach the minimum efficient scale, in this case Q3, which is the lowest point on the long run average cost curve. We call that the scale of output of productive efficiency or the minimum efficient scale. And thereafter, of course, it may be the case that firms move beyond their optimum size and experience decreasing returns to scale, uh, otherwise known as diseconomies, otherwise known as decreasing or increasing unit cost of production. Sorry. In terms of showing economies of scale, you can actually think about it in terms of moving from one short run to another. In other words, you're moving from MC1, AC1, that could be a small scale plant to a much bigger scale operation, MC2, AC2. Effectively, this is scale economies. But you can also put the envelope curve, the long average cost curve in there if you want. And you can show if the scale economies are sufficiently big, as I have here, that the profit maximizing profit and output Q2 is much higher than Q1. The yellow area bigger than the green area. And of course, consumers benefit more as well because the prices come down. Quite important to think about external economies of scale. This comes up increasingly on exam questions now. An external economy of scale is available, in theory, to all firms in an industry. And what it does is it drags down the unit costs of production across the board. So it causes a fall, a downward shift, if you like, in the long run average cost curve with external economies of scale. There's another concept which a lot of students like to, to write about, particularly in markets which are not as competitive as they might be. And this is the idea of X inefficiency. Uh, X inefficiency is the extra cost, uh, organizational slack, low productivity, big expense accounts, etc. associated with businesses who really don't face much in the way of competition. So as a result, uh, it's a, if we take output Q1, your costs per unit are actually above the higher than on the long and average cost boundary. There's a, there's a cost inefficiency there, which, of course, is going to eat into your profits for a given level of price. On the revenue side, quite important to draw your marginal and average revenue curve starting together. If you can from the y-axis, they don't necessarily have to, but uh, marginal and average revenue needs to be drawn there with the gradient of MR twice the gradient of average revenue. That's for a downward sloping demand curve. And then, of course, you can then bring cost and revenue together. And this is where most of the analysis marks are, if truth be told. Profit maximizing firm would produce at Q1, where marginal revenue meets marginal cost. You draw up to the demand curve to show the price. You find the unit cost using the average cost curve. And in this case, you can show that the firm is making some super normal profit. We include normal profit in the average cost curve of the firm. It's the opportunity cost of capital invested in the business. So if a firm is pricing above unit cost, they're making some super normal profit. Of course, it doesn't have to be the case that the business aims to maximize profit. They may have alternative objectives. So here's the sales revenue maximization point, And that's where marginal revenue is zero. Take it up to the price line. You can maximize your revenue shown by the, the uh, green area. Uh, but of course, there's a, a lower profit there because of because of cost. Some firms, of course, uh, don't aim to maximize profit. They might go for a satisficing output, somewhere in between profit maximization and, and making normal profit. So satisficing, there's more than one output here. This is where they might be looking for a bit more market share or the managers might be dominating and they, they like their bonuses, their revenue bonuses instead of the profit bonuses and things. So satisficing is an alternative to profit maximization and normally involves a lower price and a higher output, but a lower level of profit. And some firms, of course, go for growth maximization. If you get a question on, I don't know, for the sake of sake of argument, Amazon or some other fast growing business, perhaps Netflix could be a good example of this. In the short term, they're going for growth maximization. They need to cover their costs, so they need to get need to price at least equal to an average cost. But their main aim is to maximize their output to achieve the biggest market share. And you maximize output consistent with normal profit 
at a level of Q1 where average revenue meets average cost. Another big issue in the theory of the firm, another big diagram to draw, one to really nail, is the idea of the shut down price. We assume in the short term that if you close down production, you lose your fixed cost of output. So in that case, the first priority of a firm, the first target, if you like, the first aim, should be to generate enough revenue to cover your variable costs. Cover your variable costs first, then hope to cover your fixed costs. Ideally, you do both and a bit more, and therefore you make some profit. First target, cover your variable costs. So therefore, the shutdown price is any price below the minimum average variable cost, which in this diagram in front of you is price P2. Any price below there, and you couldn't cover your variable costs. Any price above P1, well, you're making a profit. This, of course, would be for perfect competition, where each firm is a price taker. So we can draw in a kind of horizontal line. Uh, not every firm makes a profit. Not every firm makes a profit. Here's a good situation where the firm is aiming to profit maximize. MC meets MR at output Q1, but the price they're charging, P1, is lower than the unit cost. Therefore, they're making an economic loss, or as the other term we would use, is a subnormal profit. And it's important, if you have a, if you have a question talking about a loss-making business, then this is the kind of diagram you want to draw. The revenues are either too low, Maybe their prices have been eaten away by competition or their costs are too high in some shape or form. The result is they make a loss. Does it mean they're necessarily shut down? Well, that depends on their variable costs. So I've added an AVC here and making a loss. But are they covering their variable costs at P1? Yes, they are. They're covering their variable costs, but they're a long way from covering their fixed costs, which, of course, is the gap between AC and AVC. So in this situation, actually, the firm would stay in production in the short term, but of course it needs to cover at least its costs and a bit more in the long run to justify staying in the market. Well, there we go. That was a quick fire journey through many of the key theory of the firm cost and revenue curve diagrams. Hopefully uh, it made sense. The next video will look at market structures. And uh, that will take you through all the key market structure diagrams you need to know for the exam. Thank you.